Hello, I'm Doug Hauser of the Historical Ordnance Video Company. In this video presentation, we will focus on Civil War siege artillery. These are a class of weapons heavier than field artillery and valued for their long range and destructive power. Now join us as we look at the variety of weapons encompassed by the siege artillery and watch two original pieces in action. It should be interesting. The siege artillery of the Union forces consisted of the heaviest class of artillery to maneuver in the field with a campaigning army. These large guns and mortars and their support material formed an army siege train. Let's look at the various siege guns used during the Civil War. The 18-pounder siege gun, a smoothbore weapon, Although obsolete at the time of the Civil War, did see garrison use. The 24-pounder was a smoothbore design and also obsolete at this time. It was mainly relegated to garrison use. Some were rifled using the James system and saw field use, but these were not very successful. The 8-inch howitzer was a smoothbore weapon capable of firing a 65-pound projectile to an effective range of 1,200 yards. They were valued throughout the war for their ability to lob shells behind the enemy defensive works. The 30-pounder Parrot was a rifled gun that fired a 27-pound projectile to an effective range of 2,200 yards. With its formidable reputation for accuracy, it was known as the sharpshooter of the siege artillery. In fortified positions, 30-pounder Parrot guns were often employed alongside seacoast guns to snipe at enemy artillery. The 4.5-inch rifle fired a 30-pound projectile to an effective range of 2,100 yards. It was a well-liked gun with a good reputation for accuracy. Here we see it limbered up and awaiting the 10-mule team, standard for transporting siege guns. Siege artillery was tactically used in many ways. Counter-battery fire against field artillery units was one of its roles. Here it was used to smash enemy batteries before they could be brought into play against friendly troops. The other major role was to breach the walls of enemy forts and destroy their earthenworks. Occasionally the guns were called into action against enemy troop concentrations and to disrupt the enemy behind the lines. Let's join the 1st Minnesota Heavy Artillery in the field as they demonstrate a rifled siege gun and a siege mortar. This is a 30-pounder Parrot, one of our uh, latest rifles in the siege gun class. This 30-pounder Parrot rifle is a basically cast iron with a wrought iron reinforced uh, breech band. The Parrot gun is manufactured in Cold Springs and it's patented in 1861. The patents actually uh, stand for the band that we're looking at that's around the breech area. There's a patent on the application of this band. The U.S. located between the, the trunnions is a federal uh, gun manufactured uh, for the Union Army as opposed to some of the, the uh, Confederate guns that are marked uh, in a different fashion. The bent cover is used for covering the vent hole. This portion is used in firing the gun, and the vent cover has a uh, lineup pin to locate it. The Parrot rifle uses a special sight that is different from 
what we uh, look at in conventional uh, smoothbore siege guns. This sight mounts in a special pocket, and the sight line, or the line of sight, is positioned at the trunnions here. This shorter line of sight is necessary because this gun is designed for high angle of fire. And obviously, if we had our sight in the normal position across the barrel, the sight would be so tremendously high, it would be very awkward to use. All of the Union guns are marked with specific markings, one of the markings being the manufacturer RPP, or Robert Parker Parrott, who is the manufacturer of this gun. The 30-pounder Parrott is marked by, first of all, showing that it's a 4.2 bore and inspected by a U.S. government inspector, RMH, the weight of the barrel being 4240, and it's casting number 338, manufactured in 1864 at the West Point Foundry, WPF. Parrot marks their barrels by uh, on the trunnion with 30 pounder PDR, which signifies the size of this gun. Uh, although some of the uh, older officers are not familiar with these new rifled markings because they refer to this gun as a nine pounder because of the bore size. But we uh, uh, know that it's also a 30 pounder because that's the weight of the elongated projectile this, this, that this gun fires. The wheels that are used on our siege carriages are all the same. It uh, doesn't make any difference whether it's a 30 pounder Parrot or a 24 pound uh, gun or whatever uh, you have. They all interchange. They also are used on the limber. The 30 pounder Parrot rifle mounts on the number two size siege carriage. This number two uh, carriage also mounts the uh, 18 pounder uh, smoothbore uh, siege gun. The basic difference in this, this carriage mount uh, from an 18 pounder is that uh, the parrot rifles use a, a different type of elevation system. This elevation screw is mounted through the castable and uh, uh, there's a special mount that we place in the stock that's different from the, uh, the normal smoothbore 18 pounder which used an elevation screw mounted in this bracket uh, on the carriage. This roller attached to the stock is used for moving the barrel back in traveling position on this bolster block. Uh, this uh, maneuver makes for carrying the weight of the uh, carriage in traveling equal on this axle as well as the uh, limber axle. These maneuvering bolts on either side are used for maneuvering the gun left or right in aiming as well as moving it in and out of battery. We also have a brake that is used on this gun for descending hills. This shoe or brake is hanged from the gun and it is applied to the wheel. When the shoe is not needed, for descending hills. The shoe is hung on the gun in its proper position and the slack of the chain is positioned back in its proper hooks on the axle body. This new 30 pounder Parrot uh, weighs 4,200 pounds and the carriage weighs 2,300 pounds. So as a result, we have to lay a platform for this gun to rest on so that we can easily maneuver this gun and point this gun at the target. A 30-pounder Parrot fires a common shell. It weighs around 27 pounds. It's hollow inside. A 30-pounder is a muzzle-loading gun, which means you have to load the projectile from the front, slide it home in front of the powder bag, when the gun is fired, the bag ex gases expand from the firing. It expands this cup 
forms into the rifling grooves which imparts spin on the projectile as it leaves the bore. So the projectile is spinning. Because this is a common shell, it has powder inside. This particular shell has a round of pound of powder inside the projectile. I'm the person that is back at the magazine activating these projectiles that will be carried up to the gun to be fired. To do that, I take a fuse wrench and unscrew the anvil, this little brass plug on the end of the fuse body. To make this projectile explode on impact, there's a slider, it's brass, it's got a little hole through the middle. Per percussion cap is inserted into one end. When this slider is, is dropped into the fuse body, it doesn't drop inside the shell, just into the body, like that, and then the plug is placed back in. Now, when this is done, I'll just tighten it down. Now, this projectile is activated. When this projectile fires out of the gun, the slider that I place in there stays put at the base of this little fuse body. When it flies through the air, it's free in there. When it, when it hits the target, the slider, because of the sudden stop, slides forward and hits the, this brass anvil, and the percussion uh, goes off. The fire goes through the hollow part of the slider and into the chamber of the projectile, and the projectile powder bursts the projectile. Let's look at a cutaway of the projectile to see how the fuse mechanism functions. On loading, the slider is free to move within the fuse body. Upon firing, the slider moves to the rear of the fuse body. As the projectile speeds toward its target, inertia keeps the slider against the rear of the fuse body. Upon impact, the slider slams against the anvil, firing the percussion cap. This results in a jet of flame traveling through the slider and the fuse body into the charged cavity, detonating the shell. To break up enemy artillerists and our troop concentrations, a time fuse is sometimes used to create an air burst over the heads of these soldiers and drive them away from their guns. To do that, we have a time fuse adapter that screws into the same place where the impact fuse adapter screwed in, in the nose of the projectile. The fuse, which looks like this, is lit by the discharge of the gun. The fuse is placed into the adapter with your thumb, exposing the powder element. The fire from discharge of the gun lights this paper time fuse. Let's turn to our cutaway to demonstrate the method of time fusing. Upon firing, the time fuse ignites. The burning time of the fuse is selected by the gunner to correspond with the range of the target. While the projectile is in flight, the time fuse burns through the fuse body until contacting the charged cavity, detonating the shell. To propel this common shell, it takes a powder charge. The powder charge for a 30-pounder Parrot consists of a three pounds by weight of charge of black powder. To convey this charge up to the gun, I would take the bag, place it in the box, and one of the cannoneers would come back and take this box up to the gun. I'm the number one man. My job is to clean the bore and to ram the powder bag and shell home. I clean the bore with the worm 
and the sponge. I'm the number two man. I assist the number one man in the sponging of the gun. I then take the cartridge from the number four man, placing it in the bar for number one to ram home. I'm the number three man. I help number one. I assist him and give him his implements to clean the gun. I help get the gun back in battery. I also insert a friction primer just before the command of fire is given to fire the gun. I'm the number four man. I serve the piece with ammunition. I return to the magazine, pick up projectile and powder charge and deliver it to number two and then assist in returning the piece to battery. I'm the number five man. I assist in returning the gun to battery with a hand spike and I also maneuver the trail with a hand spike in the pointing of the weapon. I'm the number six man. I used a hand spike to return the gun back into battery and also assist in pointing the gun. I'm the gunner on the 30 pounder parrot. My duty is to give instructions for pointing this gun, adjust the sight, and I'm in charge of the six cannoneers. This shall load! Worm. As the gun crew swings into action, the number one man calls for the worm. And the gun is level for the loading sequence. The number four man brings up the specified ammunition. Sponge. Number one man, assisted by number two, now sponges the bore to clean and extinguish any possible embers from previous firings. Two men inserts the charge in the muzzle of the gun for ramming home. The number two man brings up the shell and joined by number one, they then grease the base of the projectile. This is done to ease friction between the shell and the bore as it is rammed home. The gunner pierces the powder bag with the gimlet and attaches the rear sight. In battery. At this command, the wheel chocks okay. are removed and the crew, using their hand spikes, run the gun up into battery. Using his range tables, the gunner adjusts the elevation and sight. He then points the gun using hand signals to communicate with numbers five and six. Ready. 
At this, the last command before firing, having removed the sight and gimlet from the gun, the gun is primed with a friction primer by the number three man who fires the gun on command. Fire! Our first shot strikes in line but short of the target, located some 2,000 yards distance from the gun. The purpose of the worm is to remove any powder bag fragments or debris from the bore of the gun. Throughout the loading procedure, the gunner seals the vent with his hand to prevent air from entering the bore, possibly igniting any remaining embers. Battery. Moving 6,500 pounds of gun requires the concerted effort of the entire crew. The elevation is now corrected in light of the previous shot. Ready. Again, a friction primer is inserted into the vent and the gun is prepared to fire. fire. On our second shot, typical of Civil War fuses, the shell failed to explode. It did, however, displace a respectable quantity of earth, defining the point of impact, which indicates additional elevation is still necessary. The belt and pouch seen here on the number three man is used to carry the friction primers. I think that helps that uh, uh, grease.
large leather bag worn by the gunner is used to carry accessories that he may need in serving the gun. He also carries a separate pouch for the sight. In battery! Direct hit. firing sequence, a wooden tampion is greased and plugged in the bore. 